Hi, I'm Neil Simon and welcome to Beaverton, Oregon and the global headquarters of Tektronics. It is such a pleasure to invite you to the Vintage Tech Museum today for our own little nickel tour as part of the Tektronics Innovation Forum. This is a place where so much history has happened, been created, and we're so thankful to be able to share it with you and with the broader public through the Vintage Tech Museum that was started in 2011. And today we're joined by the museum president and former vice president of engineering and manufacturing at Tektronix, Dave Brown. Dave, you had quite the career at Tektronix and now you get to, to share so much of it with the world. Um, it, was, it was a great time. I was at the company for 34 years. And then as soon as I retired, I started working here and I've been here another 11 years. So, you know, 45 years of history with, with Tektronix. Um, I was part of the computer graphics group, the television group, and finally the test and measurement group. And in my responsibilities, I managed people all around the world. And the one thing I really, really appreciated was getting to know so many people and so many talents and the things that they actually accomplished. So it's kind of natural to come to the museum and be able to share. Um, so the museum, as you said, was founded in 2011. It was founded by two former employees, uh, Stan Griffiths and Ed Sinclair. And the objective or mission of the museum is really to encourage the next generation of engineer. Um, we do that by showing the technology, highlighting the legacy and the people. And we get a number of, of tour requests. And for the, for the younger students, we show them the technology. Um, for the older adults, we tend to go through more of the company and the company history. And we've got some wonderful exhibits here and some wonderful hands-on exhibits for the, for the students. I'm gonna start with this one, which is the 511 oscilloscope. It was the first oscilloscope designed by Tektronix. It was introduced in um, 1947. They actually didn't advertise it until 1948. People just referred to it as the Volumscope. Um, but when you get into the history of Tektronix, um, one of the things that's interesting is it's a fairly complex product. And of course, they were starting from scratch. So Miles Tippery, who um, was one of the four co-founders, um, asked Howard if there wasn't something they could start with simpler. And Howard suggested this, which is a video calibrator. Uh, it's actually a square wave generator. So they built 10 of these. And what's unique about this one is the serial number. The serial number is 11461. And what that means is November 1946, number one. That is actually the first product ever produced by Tektronix, and it's here at the museum. And what's fascinating is someone saved it. I mean, these are 74 years old. This instrument is 74 years old, and they both still function and they both still operate. That's awesome. And when you talk about preserving history, we're also preserving that inspiration for that, that next generation. And I know that at Tektronix, we're always talking about how our equipment helps the engineer see the unseen. By showing the waves, we, we see what you can't see happening inside of a computer. And music is the same way, right? There's a lot we, we hear, obviously, in music, but we don't always see it unless maybe we go somewhere else in the museum. Sure, let's walk over to this display. So Dave, you were telling me when a lot of the student groups come in, maybe they have different inclinations of their interest in math, but when they get to see an electric guitar, a synthesizer, math all of a sudden is like, wait a minute, I thought I was in an engineering museum. Where am I? Um, so this is our wave station exhibit, and we've actually done remote um, classes on, on waves. Um, but I find that in a group of students, um, there's always a number who take music lessons and they play instruments. And so I kind of start to quiz them on things, and then I try to relate it to the math. Um, but the first thing we have is just a microphone here. And on the oscilloscope, you can see your voices, and they, they love looking at that and, and making different sounds. But I'll inevitably ask, who can whistle? And if somebody can whistle, then, then we do this and you can see the waveform. And it's a very, very nice sine wave. We've got organ pipes. Um, you can blow on those and you get the same sine wave. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. And then I'll share with them the synthesizer. And on this particular one, it's just a, a this is actually a fifth, but we can go through the different sounds and I'll talk to them about why, why does this sound different than this sound. 
and your sine wave, sort of like your flutes and your, your human voices, are very, very uh, pure and, and smooth. And an instrument like a saxophone or a trumpet has some harshness to it. And so I'll explain to them the math behind that and why that's, why that's happening. And then I'll ask, you know, who all plays an instrument and a bunch of hands will go up and I'll ask them, well, what's an octave? Well, you go from C to C, but, but, but what is that? And so I'll show them on a, on a guitar. And what's interesting on the guitar is your wavelength, uh, which is the period of the, of the, of the cycle, um, is inversely proportional to the frequency. So if you go up an octave, you actually double the, the number of, of cycles. And so it's math, it's a frequency ratio of, of two to one. And then I'll ask them about the scale and how did we come about with the 12 note Western, Western kind of scale. And I'll show them that on the guitar too. And if you pluck two strings, you get kind of a pleasant, a pleasant tone. Well, the next string up is a fifth, which is 50% higher. And going through the math, there's a thing called the circle of fifths and it's how you create all those musical notes. So the instruments that you're playing all have a fundamental math background. And so I share that with them. And then the final thing we share with them is the theremin, which was actually invented 100 years ago. And it's an instrument you play with your hands. And this one happens to be quite old because it's vacuum tubes. Um, but this antenna is, is volume. This antenna, which you can play with, is pitch. And you can see the, the waveform it's creating and you can see the effect of volume. <laughs> and inevitably with our student groups, they spend time here playing the theremin, playing the guitar and talking into the microphone. And, and so it really kind of helps bring some of this alive for the, for the students. There are so many fascinating firsts here at the Vintage Tech Museum. We've got some of the first calculators ever made, some of them that were selling for thousands of dollars back in the day. And we have some of the first medical equipment, heart monitors from the 1970s. And then one of my personal favorites, this giant computer. So Dave, how much memory can this hold? Um, so this is a 4909 hard disk drive. This actually has the capacity for 32 megabytes and it uses these 16 megabyte cartridges um, that you put in. And in the day, that was a tremendous amount of memory. So this is a phone. This is 64 gigabytes. So a little bit different size. A little bit different size. <laughs> um, when the students come through, we show them vintage computers just to give them a feel for how the technology has changed. And in here on that cartridge, of course, it's a hard drive. It's stored on, on um, magnetic media, and it, this is actually the, the disc out of the center of that one. And this can hold? That's 32, 32. megabytes. 32. Yeah. Um, what we have here is the 4051. This was the third generation calculator. So that was an evolution. Instead of having, you know, 10 digits of display, they put the storage screen on. So this is fundamentally an oscilloscope CRT that's been specifically designed for storage, which came out in um, the mid 60s and companies were buying the oscilloscope just to put computer graphics on the little tiny display. So that opened up a new market for Tektronix of making a large one. And they added the um, intelligence and came out in 1975 with a desktop computer. Um, so we're looking at an instrument here that's more than 40 years old. Um, it's still high resolution. Um, these were used all over the world um, by all sorts of people because you could put a computer on your desktop and it got away from the timeshare and all that kind of stuff. It was your, your personal computer. In the back are, are um, PACs and Tektronix sold applications. So they sold statistic applications, electrical engineering applications, mechanical engineering applications, and you would put it in and you had that power at your fingertips. And what you mentioned about the customers demanding different things, this desire for graphics, the desire to have your own dedicated, you know, working you know, computer. This is about listening to what the customers want and going where they want to go. Where does that culture come from? Well, innovation is really around creating a culture that observes the customer and what they're trying to do and understanding how you bring technology to that to make their job easier. And you know, one of the great examples of that was the creation of the World Wide Web. I mean, it's strictly around sharing technology, information, 
um, anywhere in the world and trying to get it in, into various forms. So by watching what customers were doing, you had the ability to say, I can make that job easier, here's the technology I could bring, and here's how you can use that. And I understand from what I've read, what I've learned, and I've enjoyed walking around the museum, Howard Volum and starting this company, uh, the way he walked around and the questions he would ask of engineers always was, was probing in his own way for that next element of discovery. Uh, anything that you would want to share about that? So I actually never really met Howard Volum, um, but I've known a lot of people who did meet Howard Volum. Uh, some of them work at the museum. Howard would walk around just to find out what the engineers were working on, and he would ask these probing questions really to get them to think. And on some of them, because they thought and came up with some different angle, they would try to put Howard's name on the patent disclosure. And Howard was, no, no, that was, that was, that was yours. Um, but he would ask these questions, I think predominantly to learn, but he got people kind of out of their box. Um, but Howard also had a sense of humor. And um, Frank Hood, who was an early employee, told the story that, that we just love. Um, Tektronix was growing by leaps and bounds in the 50s. They were hiring people like crazy. And one day Howard went to the employment office and he was kind of wandering around. And this lady from HR said, you know, we're really busy. Um, here's an application, Howard, or not, I shouldn't say Howard. Here's an application, fill it out. And Howard sat down and filled it out and under the name Howard Volum, uh, position desired. He wrote down either engineering or manufacturing and just turned it in. And she had no idea who he was and he just kind of had fun. So there's those, those kind of those kind of stories. And Dave, to see the company now, celebrating 75 years, continuing to engineer the future, working for ever smaller, more energy efficient devices, you know, the next you know, wave of 5G and all of the new technological demands that the consumers have out there. How do you feel about what Tektronix is doing for the next generation? So, so the first thing that comes to mind is achieving 75 years is monumental. There aren't a lot of companies that have done that. Um, Tektronix always has been pushing the future and using the, some of the most brilliant people in the world to innovate how we bring technology to solve those, those solutions. And the technology in this day, um, we tend to think of as being more difficult. I don't think it was. It's certainly bigger and it involved you know, a, a breadth of, of disciplines. Um, but Tektronix has been on that forefront. They'll continue to be on that forefront. And the people that come to the museum are amazed at kind of what the history of the company was and how, how broad of, of the technology they had. And that's, that's still kind of the case. Dave, thank you so much. Thank you for what you're doing here. Before I started at Tektronix, people said, you've got to come to the museum. You've got to see what has grown to today and all of the innovation that has inspired where we are today. And I'm honored to have had the chance to walk around and to share it with you. And if you're ever in Beaverton, do not be a stranger. Come by the Vintage Tech Museum.